All right. Well, I really want to thank uh, Tom for that warm introduction and, of course, Dr. Shah for coming out to UCLA. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's your first time here, but we're hoping we'll have you back soon. Thank you. Um, I want to thank our partners as well for putting this event together. It's really a privilege. You may know we had Melinda Gates out just a couple of months ago. So we've had a nice run of discussions about uh, aid and development, um, and we're very excited to hear from you. So the way this will work is uh, we will have a brief discussion, um, maybe 15 minutes or so, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. We do have handheld mics, so just wait to be called on. The handheld mic will come to you. We're videotaping this event, so I will have to paraphrase your question. Um, so uh, the shorter, clearer, and more concise you can make your question, the better I will paraphrase it uh, for the purposes of posterity. So please, please do so. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing a lot of interesting questions from um, what I think is a very diverse group of students, faculty, and staff here. So, um, so let me start off with something kind of some big picture issues. So USAID is, is almost six decades old. Uh, and um, of course, development assistance is even older than that mm -hmm. in some ways. So I know you've talked in your tenure about a new development model. Um, can you kind of give us your sense of what have we learned over this long effort? Uh, and I know there's a lot of critics on the right and the left about not only USAID, but development in general, um, or development programs in general. So what do you see as the major lessons, and what's your sense of the best new model going forward? Sure. Well, thank you, Callan. And let me first just start by thanking you for having me here. It's exciting. Uh, as a lifelong Big Ten fan to be uh, <laughs> visiting you all. Uh, I grew up in, in Detroit, Michigan. The Rose Bowl was it for year after year. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. I'm also thrilled to be with Tom. Uh, you know, I, I know you all know this and, and have a tremendous respect for your leader and Tom, but his uh, research work has really opened up very important pathways for bringing science, technology, and, and real evidence to the fight against HIV AIDS around the world. And it's something I know uh, you can take pride in, Tom, but also something that can inspire your, your students and the, and the community of leaders here that are always thinking about how do we bring science and evidence to the task at hand. And to get to your question, you know, USAID is the world's uh, largest development and humanitarian agency. We spend about $22 billion a year in just around 70 countries. Uh, probably 30 or 40 years ago, we would have accounted together with our colleagues at the World Bank and, and other agencies like ours around the world for 80 plus percent of foreign investment that went into an emerging market economy or a developing country. And at that level of relevance, uh, a lot of what we did at the time uh, was you know, laying the groundwork and infrastructure for economic growth and development. And some of it was highly successful, like the South Koreas of the world and some of it was less successful, like the Hades of the world. And I think if there's anything we've learned, it's that over that course of time, uh, there's now so much more private capital, private ingenuity, local sources of wealth and natural resources uh, that can drive better developmental outcomes. And today, the $135 billion a year that is what we call official assistance accounts for at best 10 to 14% of foreign direct investment into the pool of countries in which we provide those resources. So to really be effective, we have to be highly leveraged. We have to partner with the private sector here and there. We have to really measure rigorously the results of our work, bringing more randomized controlled trial methodologies and more science around what works, what doesn't work to the task. And we have to focus on those areas where we, as the United States, has something super unique to offer. And I'm thrilled to be in a medical uh, institution because biomedical research, innovation, technology, these are areas of excellence across the American economy and research system. And it's often where we are doing our best work abroad. That's great. Would you say, you mentioned public-private partnerships. I want to come back to that in a second. Um, but one of the things that I was curious about is have you brought or do you see a change in the way that we apply um, evidence to our program? So in other words, are we more data-driven and evidence-based now in yeah. our policies than we were, let's say, 15 years ago? Oh, uh, without question, absolutely. And I know you had uh, Melinda Gates here as well as others. I, I credit the Gates Foundation, but also a lot of other partners and institutions 
uh, with bringing a more evidence-based mindset to this work. And, and today, you know, we're, we're just much more rigorous in measuring results and in using data to direct our efforts. Behind me is a slide of uh, a, a burial team working in West Africa to identify uh, those who have died of Ebola in Liberia and remove their bodies from their communities and, and dispose of them in a dignified and respectful but also safe manner. And that's a good example. You know, if you read the press, as I'm sure you all did, a few weeks before the election, you would have thought, oh, we need tens of thousands of uh, Ebola treatment unit beds throughout West Africa to handle this onslaught. The reality is 70% of transmission, and Arnott was, you know, 1.8 in late September, uh, which means for every one case, there were 1.8 additional cases through infection. 70% of that transmission was uh, families hugging, kissing, washing, and burying the deceased. So we said, well, maybe you don't need all those beds. Maybe we need to try new things to go after that. And, and we put together these uh, burial teams, and they were extraordinarily effective. Within two months, they had reduced transmission. They had reached about 95% of all <coughs> deceased bodies throughout Liberia within 24 hours disposed of them safely, and as a result, the Arnott went under one, under one for the first time about eight weeks after we started that effort, really before many of the new Ebola treatment unit beds even came online. Mm -hmm. So that, it's just an example of, of data, evidence, stay focused and concentrate on the highest leverage points of intervention can make a huge, huge difference. And uh, try when you're reading the press to take some of the guidance there with a grain of salt. Good. Good. I do want to return to Ebola and also to Haiti that you mentioned. Um, but on public-private partnerships, I mean, one thing I've noticed, I work very closely with the UN. They've created an Office of Partnerships now for the first time. Um, that's a mantra you hear across a lot of domains in, let's say, international efforts of all kinds, development or not. So what do you see from your vantage point is driving that push? Why are we reaching out more and more um, in this way that whether it's the NGO sector, whether it's private businesses, yeah. whether it's um, local firms or multinationals, yeah. what's fueling that? Well, well, first let me just say, when I started at USAID, about 9% of our investment portfolio went into large-scale results-oriented public-private partnerships. Today that number is closer to 60%. And the biggest initiatives we have are in power, health, and food and agriculture. And food and agriculture is just one instructive example. Uh, you know, there are 860 million people that will go to bed hungry tonight. 600 million of them live in agrarian countries, in rural communities, and in families that are dependent on food production for their own uh, consumption as well as main source of income. And we know that agriculture in these places is, is easily a, a tenth to a, a third of what it could be with some simple support and improved technology and, and practices and access to markets. But simply, you know, in giving out food or investing and in even buying seeds and giving out seeds, that really can work for a little while. It doesn't systemically move hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and hunger. What does is creating proper commercial agricultural markets, enticing billions of dollars of private sector investment convincing countries to change their rules and regulations to respect private capital, technology, science-based approaches, and then reaching you know, tens of millions of people with that basic package. And we launched an effort we call the New Alliance for Food Security at the G8 in, at uh, Camp David a few years ago. Today we reach with a billion dollars of public investment and almost uh, $10 billion total over five years of private investment commitments. We reach 7 million small-scale farmers around the world, 12 million children in those households that would otherwise be chronically malnourished are adequately nourished. Average incomes have gone up by more than 50%. Average yields for basic staple crops have, in many cases, like Haiti, gone up more than 100%. And we can collect data on uh, household uh, food consumption, disaggregate income by women and men, study the consequences and impacts. And in my favorite data that just came out of Ethiopia, we saw an actual 4% annualized reduction in the rate of stunting through Ethiopia, which over that program period, which was really extraordinary, because if you know stunting, it, you know, it's not something you think will respond so quickly uh, because it's such a chronic condition. So 
My, I guess my point is, uh, if you want to solve big problems at scale, uh, it's almost impossible to identify a problem where any one type of partner can actually do that on their own. You have to be in the business of building these kinds of partnerships, of inspiring others, of pulling people together and convening them, and then tackling the problem in a results-oriented way. Can these, I mean, these trends all sound great, and can they both, meaning the, the move to be more evidence-based and to work more closely with partners outside the government, is it a challenge within the U.S. government to sustain those, given that you know, we're, we're famous for having such a heavy um, political level in our yeah. government. So we have a huge number of political appointees compared to, let's say, the UK, where it's a very tiny, tiny amount. So there's a lot of turnover, as you know, better than anyone here, in terms of the kinds of policies that are brought in when an administration changes. So is that a challenge to kind of fulfill the long-term policy agenda that you've laid out or that your predecessors laid yeah. out? Yeah, well, well, you know, I, I will give you both a yes and a no answer to that. The yes part, is that any big bureaucracy is difficult to transform. And you know, I'm proud of the fact we actually were fortunate. We had a lot of bipartisan support in Congress. So over the last five years, our budgets have on average been higher than the president's request because I think a lot of uh, Republican leaders in particular value this public-private approach to the way we do our work. Uh, but even what that's enabled is we've doubled the size of our foreign service. We've greatly expanded uh, the size of our uh, scientific and technical groups. We were able to go out after the crisis and the financial crisis and hire 40 outstanding young financial analysts that are coming off Wall Street and in search of meaning and contribution in the world. And we gave, we gave them that opportunity. And I'll tell you, it's easy to be humorous about it, but those folks have uh, helped us use new tools like local currency loan guarantees that now unlock a billion dollars a year at almost no cost to the U.S. taxpayer, about 15 to 20 million dollars a year to That's run great. the program. And they're, they're motivating a billion dollars of lending to small-scale coffee entrepreneurs and farmers organizations and medical groups uh, around the world in, in poorer countries. So there's so much opportunity for innovation and scale but you do have to be determined about transforming, you know, in this case, a large-scale large, large scale bureaucracy. And, and I'm, I'm very proud of the way the USAID team has sort of stepped up to the challenge. That's great. So let me circle back to Ebola. Um, I know you were there in West Africa recently. Um, it's certainly something that's receded from the headlines here. I think probably here in a you know, medical school environment, we're very aware of it. I think the general public, maybe less so today. Um, what are the successes that you want to identify most strongly, and what is it that the American public needs to know that they don't know? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think... Or, or let me say, needs to appreciate that they may not fully That they may not appreciate. I, I would just say, first, in an interconnected world, and our world is obviously and increasingly interconnected, uh, we really do have to live out the reality uh, that a disease outbreak somewhere in the world has relevance to us at home. You know, whether or not a couple of cases end up in Texas or, or Atlanta or anywhere else. And, and uh, that mindset is particularly important. So I'm glad President Obama had that mindset early on and created a global se health security effort actually before the Ebola outbreak with, with 30 or 40 countries around the world to, to really uh, deal with exactly that challenge. The other reality is uh, the data systems in many of these countries are extraordinarily poor. So if you look at the history of Ebola outbreaks, they tend to be small, relatively self-contained, and despite the hype, remember the hype kind of got a little out of control three weeks before an election, and I'm sure uh, there was some correlation there. But, but if you, uh, but in general, Ebola outbreaks would, you know, you'd have uh, 10 to 40 cases and then you'd have a pretty rapid tailing off. You saw that epidemiological dynamic take place in March, April, and May of last year. So the, the big challenge in, to the global community and for all of us to think about and work on together is why in June and July did the world miss the quick re-emergence of the disease and why did it take <coughs> urban spread in Monrovia before the world really you know got serious about tackling this in, in that context and the reason in my mind is because people didn't have the data 
we, we have uh, very poor data systems. We weren't visualizing the data. There were epidemiologists on the ground in all three countries. Uh, they just didn't have good real-time data, and they were doing, and so pardon my use of this term, they were doing kind of academic analyses of what had transpired and what might transpire and a lot of modeling. And what, they, what we really needed was thousands of community health uh, workers, low level of skill, but with a mobile phone, with the ability to say, we think this person has a hemorrhagic fever, to send it into a centralized place and for someone to chase that down and put it on a map so the rest of us can all see it. That's not you know, deep analytic insight, that's just process and making it work. So when we uh, really started taking it on in Liberia in September and October, we had about 100, 120, in some cases 160 new cases per day. And uh, there was a lot of global panic about how many beds should we build out and this and that. And that's when you know, we really scaled up our effort. Uh, the United States took the lead. We put together a global coalition. And most importantly, we really insisted on data-driven interventions. So the burial teams were hugely important. The, the social mobilization campaign was critically important. You know, the fact that I would visit and we would elbow bump and no one would shake hands. You'd have chlorine at, at every doorstep, at every building, signs everywhere. And by changing the culture of touching each other and having the burial teams tackling the main vector of transmission, uh, and slowly but surely building out isolation capacity in a, in a professional manner, we were able to get the number of new cases down significantly so that yesterday we had about three new cases mm -hmm. in Liberia. And I guess that leads me to the last point, which is uh, I love the American media because when there's a crisis, they're great at uh, explaining that there's a crisis and <laughs> getting people excited about it. Um, I'm waiting for someone to write the story that says, you know, an extraordinary amount of human courage, effort, and skill uh, led to this massive and, and effective reduction. And we're by no means out of the woods. This is going to be an 18th month fight. Getting to zero is very, very tough and requires us to innovate every day. Just three weeks ago, we put in place helicopter transport for lab specimens so that we can reduce the wait times for people who have symptoms. And remember, the symptoms mimic malaria during the malaria season in a malaria, three malaria endemic countries. So that's a, a very real challenge. But it's constant evolution and being absolutely data focused that will get us to zero and sustaining that. That's really fantastic work. One um, other player in this, I think as everyone knows, has been the American military. And so I'm just curious about how, you, how USAID works with the military in terms of, you know, a lot of attention was paid to trying to stand yeah. up hospitals and obviously the military has unparalleled logistical push power. So was that a fruitful kind of relationship or what can you say about it? Absolutely. In fact, uh, when we go into these settings, the way it works is USAID is the, is the disaster response coordinator and we draw in military assets as needed and we direct their deployment and we're responsible for, you know, uh, paying for them and making sure that they're safe and used appropriately. So in this context, uh, really one of the biggest contributions the military made was putting in place the, the DOD labs in Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea that have helped to reduce the wait times on the diagnostic information quite significantly. And if you, if you know the design of an Ebola treatment unit, you, know, you, you go into a waiting area, which is a pretty high risk area, right? There are more positives there, everyone's symptomatic. And, uh, and you might have malaria, you might have Ebola, and our goal was to say we need to find out as quickly as possible and get people out. And I, and I thought there was maybe a lot of infection going on when, with people being cloistered together for two or three days while they wait for a lab result. And by putting the DOD labs in place and then putting the helicopter transport, we now have it down to about four to seven hours to get that result almost anywhere in the country. And that, uh, that's been a huge part of, of uh, what success looks like. So, you know, we have about 25 uh, American military personnel on the ground. They have helped build about 1,700 Ebola treatment unit beds uh, for capacity in Liberia. Uh, deeply committed, uh, absolutely proud of their service. And one of my favorite moments was watching our military personnel unload a Chinese uh, aircraft that was bringing in personal protective equipment. Uh, and it just goes to show you that times of crises are also times when you can motivate real partnership across sometimes unique uh, 
collaborations. The, the other thing I'd say is if you look at the slide behind me now, this is uh, something we did with DOD that was a lot of fun, but we created the U.S. Global Development Lab. And uh, I don't know how many of you have put on the protective equipment or, or, or been in a setting that requires that, but there, you know, the, the protective equipment everyone's using were designed for basically chemical spill situations in, the, in U.S. industrial use, not for tropical uh, infectious disease response. And in fact, a lot of the healthcare workers that were getting sick were getting sick when they were taking their goggles off because that's when their hands would touch their mucous membranes and, and you'd get uh, greater uh, transmission and infection there. So we said, well, let's try to redesign. And, and frankly, to be honest, uh, we went down to Atlanta with the president and he met with returned healthcare workers and they said, you know, it's just too hot in those suits. You can only work for 30 to 45 minutes and uh, you just overheat and, and so we need to do something. So the president got very focused on redesigning the suit which meant the rest of us got very focused on redesigning the suit. And, and so through our new U.S. Global Development Lab, we got everyone together in, in a maker space in Northern Virginia. That's the photo there. And we had scientists from Motorola and Kimberly Clark and DuPont makes a lot of the, the product with DOD and CDC and, and some of the healthcare workers from MSF in, uh, in uh, Guinea. And, and we just worked together for several days and did a competition and they redesigned the suit. And this is the new suit. So uh, it's hard to tell from the photo alone and the diagram, but basically instead of having 12 different pieces of headgear that all go on independently and have to be removed independently, this is one uh, piece, it's fully integrated. It has a, an enlarged color-coded zipper on the back that allows you to basically just walk out of it. And the time to get out of this suit in an infection environment has come down from about 25 minutes to under three as a result of that. And the number of actual discrete actions has come down from something like 42 to something like six or seven. And you know, that's, it's those kinds of innovations. This is not a Nobel Prize material, but this is probably gonna do more to save the lives of healthcare workers and ensure the sustainability of the response throughout West Africa over time. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun to do. And it, I think it's also an illustration of how no matter what setting you're working in, innovation, technology, applied to the challenge you face can, can really change our capacity to solve difficult problems. It's impressive. So uh, let me ask two more questions and we'll open it up. So Haiti, you mentioned uh, earlier, today is the fifth anniversary of the earthquake. A uh, very devastating event coming on top of a very difficult history um, of many development efforts and by far the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere still today. So um, can you tell us some good news uh, or what's your prognosis about the situation there? Well, uh, first I'd say I started uh, on about a week and a half before the Haiti earthquake five years ago. So actually the first call I got from the president was, uh, was a call saying, you know, you're going to have to be in charge. You're going to not have to. He said, you are in charge of the Haiti <laughs> earthquake response. And, uh, and I said, okay. Uh, <laughs> And it was a very short call, actually. That was, <laughs> that was the full extent of it. Uh, and uh, it was actually funny, because uh, I'm sitting in my office and obviously watching on television the president. So he made that call, and about 45 seconds later, he was in front of the press and saying, you know, I just spoke to Administrator Shaw, and he's in charge. I said, oh, yeah, that's why he called. So, but, uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's at times of crises that, that our country really performs. And, and on the Haiti earthquake, more than 50% of all American families donated in some way to the Haiti earthquake. That doesn't happen in other countries. That's just an extraordinary commitment of moral uh, service that, that comes from uh, families throughout our country. And we mounted the largest and most effective urban response ever to a humanitarian crisis. Within three weeks, we had three million people in feeding programs. We were with the largest urban search and rescue effort ever mounted with 62 um, urban search and rescue teams from around the world. And they saved a few hundred individuals. They pulled out of the rubble, like you see in this photo right here. And, uh, and that, frankly, as challenging as that was, that part of the response was, was almost uh, the less difficult part. The harder part is, is reconstruction and recovery. And uh, we had a very concerted effort. We've committed uh, nearly two and spent about $2 billion over the last five years. 
and uh, there have been lots of areas where I'd like to see progress move faster. But please remember, Haiti is, uh, was the poorest country in this hemisphere and still is. And the results do, in my view, speak for themselves. The, the Haitian average growth rate was about 2%, now it's about 5%. The level of foreign direct investment on a monthly basis is 300% was it what it was before the earthquake. Even with a cholera epidemic that was almost certainly externally imposed on, on the people of Haiti, the diarrheal disease rate today is lower than it was the day before the earthquake. The you know, child survival has uh, gone up significantly. <coughs> child, acute and chronic child malnutrition has gone down by about 30%. We stopped the practice of dumping American food on the Haitian food market and calling it food aid. Mm -hmm. And that plus targeted investments in research and science and agriculture have yet led to a 125% increase in corn yields, a 300% increase in bean yields, which is a main source of protein for a lot of Haitian families and kids and has helped uh, really create a much more vibrant rural economy, which still provides 65% of total employment in Haiti. I was there a few days before the holidays, and uh, we had a chance to visit a tablet manufacturer that is making uh, you know, iPad-like tablets that are designed specifically for educational content and other applications that can be used by the children throughout that country. And it will be, de development is a decades long process, uh, but it's important to stay focused on the data. And I think the data show that we've made huge progress in Haiti. Uh, if, you, if you get a chance, look up Nick Kristof's article that published on Christmas Day, uh, because he was there on, uh, on that day and, and he wrote an excellent data-driven piece about our Feed the Future program in Haiti. Terrific. So Last question, there's a lot of students in the audience. If they, what's the single uh, advice, a piece of advice you would give them if they want to make a difference in the world in terms of development and human welfare, what should they do? Well, stay super committed, you know, <laughs> you, and be really, really confident in your own capacity to, to make a difference. Uh, it's true that, you know, at the end of the day, you can actually think about development and global health as the result of how many people on Earth live and benefit from modern science, knowledge, technology. And you know, as we get vaccine coverage to hundreds of millions of additional children, as we get the rate of child death down significantly country after country, uh, we're standing right at the cusp of a very important decade. And, and actually, between now and 2030, for the first time, in human history, it's possible to imagine that dollar and a quarter a day poverty, which you know is still accounts for the way a billion, 1.1 billion people on Earth live, that we can eliminate that almost entirely. And uh, and and I think and you know let me just show you this because this is a, a photo of uh, obviously a young a young child, uh, and birth asphyxia is still a main cause of death for children uh, just after childbirth. We worked with a group of students who developed a uh, conti continuous positive airway pressure device, a CPAP. But, and you'd say, well, we have CPAPs all over the place. What's the big deal? The big deal was they, these were this was a Tulane medical student team. And they, in their original device, they used a Nalgene bottle and just kind of pieced it together. Then they got a manufacturer to make it. And, and they're producing it at a very low cost. We now distribute it throughout uh, uh, Malawi and some other countries and it saves a lot of lives. And, and we could never afford to buy kind of a US hospital cost CPAP machine and distribute it around the world, but they were able to do something creative and inspiring that saves lots of little children. And so I would just say, if you're a student or faculty or anyone else, um, engage with us on these grand challenges in, in global health and global development, which was the competition that led to that particular effort. You can engage with us through the U.S. Global Development Lab. Uh, you can work with us actually directly if anyone. We have global health fellowships in particular, and we're always looking for very talented uh, leaders to come join us. And we're particularly focused on this unique opportunity in the next 15 years to, to end the, the reality that six and a half million children still die under the age of five every year, mostly of very simple preventable diseases. Great, thank you so much. So, um, so as promised, we do have time for questions. We do have microphones, so please raise your hands um, when you're ready for a question, and I'll have a mic brought over to you. Um, 
Rustin, come on down here. We've got one. Um, well, Tom, I'm going to give Tom the prerogative of the first question, oh, and then we'll, we'll move on. So right here in the front. Thanks, Raj. Thanks for, uh, for being here today. Oh, boy. Is that better? No. I'll hold it out here. Um, my question is, is a slightly two-part question. One is um, the, the U.S. response to HIV-AIDS has been phenomenal and has made a remarkable difference. Uh, unlike Ebola, it doesn't rise and fall quickly. Uh, will that, do you see that response being able to be sustained? And is it also possible to replicate that for other kinds of diseases? Well, I think we have, well, first, thank you. I think we have sustained it, right? We spend about five and a half billion dollars a year on our global HIV response. And under President Obama, the budgets have gone up and the number of patients covered has gone up significantly. Uh, I still think when you look at, how, well, how many people are positive today around the world? 38 million? 38 million, yeah. yeah. And so I still think when you look at the big numbers, uh, we have to continue to push ourselves to uh, come up with and scale those low-cost interventions like male circumcision, uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission, uh, reaching high-risk populations with prevention as part of the package to really turn the tide on the 38 million. Uh, but the fact that we now have, how many people total under coverage? Is it? 38%. About 38%, yeah. HIV yeah, population. which has been a game changer, yeah. just without question. But we're only gonna tackle, you're only gonna get the Ebola-like curve Right? When, when you're reaching everybody and you're cutting off those main points of transmission that, that require uh, different, differentiated interventions that are provided in, in an effective manner. So I, I think we've sustained it. I think we will sustain it. I think we'll, we'll stay on that fight. Uh, the one thing I'd like to see us do a better job of, and many of you here could kind of invent the ideas that we could use to do this, is I wish that of that five and a half billion, I wish more of it kind of had dual purpose. You know, it had the ability to build health systems that, that tackle HIV and at the same time create a baseline community health system that is capable of reducing malaria mortality, diarrheal disease mortality, um, simple pneumonia-related <coughs> mortality. And it's striking to me, like, what, what, there's a, take Nigeria, we spend you know, $350 million a year in southern parts of Nigeria on HIV. And, and in my view, as a country, we don't have enough capacity to really tackle the simple causes of child death in, that are mostly in northern Nigeria, uh, but where, you know, you have very, very high rates of malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia-related child mortality. And I think when our global health community kind of invents ways to be more comprehensive with these resources and investments, that's when we're going to see the, the big systemic shifts. So I forgot to repeat Tom's question as I was instructed. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that now, but, uh, but I'm going to do it for the rest. So again, I'm just going to urge everyone to, to ask a very clear question that even I can understand and I can repeat it. So uh, I see a lot of hands up. Um, let's uh, right here in the uh, check shirt. Thank you for being here. I wanted to ask you, considering the global reach of Chinese government economic aid programs, what is USAID's uh, approach to partnering or having sustained relationships with Chinese economic aid donors? Yeah. So, so the question concerns uh, the role of China and the interactions between China and, let's say, work that someone like Dr. Shaw might do. Yeah, thank you. Well, I wanted to, as, as part of an answer to that, I want to share with you a little narrative about Power Africa. If you look at this slide, you'll see uh, some young kids, obviously, with, with a, an off-grid light source. And it's really striking to me, but there's still about 500 plus million people in sub-Saharan Africa that don't have regular access to electricity. Still about 300 million, maybe 400 million in South Asia that are in that same position. And in urban places in those environments that do have access to energy, the cost is four or five times what it could be, and the blackout rates are so high that, that basically starting, running, and employing people in a business becomes a very costly enterprise. And for 15 years, as you point out with your question, 
the solution, the assumed solution was, well, the China, go to China for basically really cheap debt secured against local natural resources and they will build you power plants and roads and infrastructure. And for a variety of reasons that uh, did not transpire as a successful outcome. I mean, there are some places where that infrastructure has helped dramatically, but in general, uh, we still have the same problems of lack of access to power and infrastructure around the world. So President Obama launched an effort called Power Africa and said, look, let's bring U.S. economic standards, uh, companies from around the world, investors from around the world, and let's work intensively with governments instead of aiding and abetting corruption to really fight corruption and create transparency <laughs> such that power projects and other types of projects become bankable, investable, commercial opportunities. And in 18 months, really 24 months now, uh, no, I guess, yeah, in 24 months, we've basically uh, clo achieved financial close on 23 Power Africa projects that will produce 2,800 megawatts of energy. And we've worked with public and private donors and companies and investors around the world to create a $26 billion pool of public-private investment for power projects in Africa. That, uh, I think that tells you a lot right there, that we have an opportunity to work with our Chinese colleagues, uh, but that, that standards, um, transparency, uh, public, true public-private partnership, and governments taking the lead in cleaning up their own governance processes and regulations such that private capital can deliver on these outcomes is, is in my view, the path forward. Now, I must be really dazzled by Dr. Shaw because I forgot one of my other uh, <laughs> things, which is I, I always encourage students to ask questions and hold a couple for them. And I know that there are many here in the room that I don't really see raising their hands. Um, so, so I'm going to hold off until I see um, a student question right here. OK. And could you introduce yourself when you ask the question? Too? Thank you. Excellent. I actually work with the USAID office in Jakarta as well. Um, but I, my question is about the Global Development Lab. I've been following it since it launched in April, and I'm very fascinated with what um, your vision for that is. And I would like, I was, I'm also particularly interested in finding out how you see the data that comes out of the lab, especially across the Higher Education Solutions Network, and how to translate that into um, the thoughtful projects that can be implemented on the field in a, on a large scale. Okay, so the question concerns the global development labs and how the data and information coming out of them can be converted to policy in the field. Well, well, thank you. Thanks for your service in Jakarta, and thanks for your uh, extraordinarily detailed question <laughs> about the lab. <laughs> if, if I weren't paying attention, I'd have to like get some help here. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, the lab actually came out of a conversation the president and I had early on where, where, we, where we agreed that the energy and and spirit around in the American public for doing this kind of work often is strongest on college campuses and that it's young people that have this burning optimism about what's possible around the world and a desire to use their skills and, and their uh, capacity to learn technical skills and apply it in this setting. So we created the Global Development Lab and have seeded a number of uh, innovation labs on college campuses throughout the country, which is what you refer to as the Higher Education Solutions Network. Uh, our California partner for that is, is at UC Berkeley. Well, we have and, to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, we, and, so, and we are excited about the fact that you know, a lot of these student teams have been able to do some very interesting things. One of the things we've made a focus of the lab is bringing open, more data collection, open data collection, and technology-enabled data collection to the work. So you see in the photo here uh, a, young, a young girl basically going through something we call an EGRA, an early grade reading assessment. And now we use a, a tablet assessment system for second and third grade kids around the world in our education programs to get an actual valid measure of educational attainment. The test takes about 20 minutes. I've seen it applied in Nepal, and, and in Nepal, the results, which will come out shortly, will be really the first time in that country's history that they have educational attainment data for second and third graders. It is unbelievable. And obviously, when we have the data, 
we want to make it open. We want to disaggregate by girls and boys. We want to understand which regions are doing better and worse. And we want to do it longitudinally so that you can actually track progress and then invest in those things that deliver better outcomes. This goes back to your first question because, you know, 15 years ago the challenge was let's just get everybody into school. Now the challenge has to be let's get everybody into school but let's also make sure they're learning and let's bring our best knowledge on how to do that. And the U.S. Global Development Lab enabling technology and data to be a part of that solution, in my view, will do some extraordinarily special things to helping the world's poorest people lead better lives. Great. Except for a few more. Um, right here on the aisle. Yes. That's OK. <laughs> uh, first, I just want to say thank you for your great work and ask you, uh, with Ebola, the, you know, one of, of course, there's thousands now of orphans. I'm wondering what USAID's role is in dealing with that problem. And I also want to share with you that I had the good fortune of being uh, the president's appointee as the US alternate representative when, oh, good. And got to, I, was, I participated in getting all of the co sponsors for the Ebola uh, resolution. Excellent. Which was the biggest, largest number of uh, co sponsors we ever got. And gave a speech at the General Assembly about U.S. role in malaria. And just want to say how moved I was when all these countries came up to me after my speech and thanked the United States for not forgetting about malaria. So yeah. it's appreciated. I'm going to have some difficulty paraphrasing that. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so what role is USAID, ASID playing with Ebola orphans? Well, you yeah, know, we were just tackling this, and the reality is I think someone told me there were th just yesterday or the day before there are almost 40,000 uh, Ebola orphans mm -hmm. in, in the region now. And you know, it's extraordinary. I, I visited an Ebola treatment unit in Guinea where uh, a mother was with her three-year-old uh, son who had Ebola, and she refused to stay out of the hot zone because you can imagine why, right? And this is a disease that, that really kills the people who love those who are, uh, are infected first, and that meant, and that is mostly mothers and fathers, but mothers in particular. So it's very, very serious, very consequential. Uh, we'll, we already have and will expand greatly this coming year our programs for orphans, our support for restarting agriculture, our investments in water and sanitation, our um, efforts to get the schools reopened and to get kids back into safe and effective learning environments in all three Ebola-affected countries. The reason we can do that is because in December, uh, Congress passed a uh, emergency funding request where the president asked for significant resources for us, not just to lead the emergency part of the response, but to rebuild better the environments in which these families and kids will now you know, have to return and grow. And um, I'm really grateful that Congress passed that part of the budget and did so with, with universal uh, bipartisan support. So, but it, it raises, you've raised an important issue and in mentioning the UN I think it's also worth noting this year of 2015 is a very important year in development because it's the year that the UN and its partner nations will come together and determine whether or not to adopt the goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030. And that goal then includes ending child hunger by 2030, ending child death by 2030. Um, a whole series of what we call zero goals and no girl being out of school. Uh, and, you know, I just would make the point that I've come to believe uh, in my time at Gates and USAID watching the system that these big global goals do matter. That, you know, companies begin to assess how they can contribute to the effort and do things. UN agencies that can sometimes be all over the place have a greater likelihood of being focused and results oriented. Scientists, medical communities, researchers like yourselves can, can say, okay, if you're choosing between X and Y, and Y is aligned with the goal of ending maternal mortality, uh, maybe, and that's prioritized, maybe there's more funding available and more momentum and more of a pathway from your interesting uh, insights to impact and scale if you choose to align with the goals. 
So I think it's very important that everyone here and all of us together push this year in whatever capacity we can for the world to adopt this goal because it really is for the first time achievable and it's so important that we continue to maintain our focus and our determination to achieve it. I couldn't agree more. Dr. Shah, we are uh, at the end of the hour. Please come back and visit us again soon. You're always welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.